As a reading this morning, I'd like to offer this from Brad Aaron Maudlin, and it's called, What You Missed That Day You Were Absent from Fourth Grade. <laughs> Mrs. Nelson explained how to stand still and listen to the wind, how to find meaning in pumping gas, how peeling potatoes can be a form of prayer. She took questions on how not to feel lost in the dark. After lunch, she distributed worksheets that covered the ways to remember your grandfather's voice. Then the class discussed falling asleep without feeling you had forgotten to do something else, something important, and how to believe the house you wake up in is your home. This prompted Mrs. Nelson to draw a chalkboard diagram detailing how to chant the Psalms during cigarette breaks and how not to squirm for sound when your own thoughts are all you hear. Also, that you have enough. The English lesson was that I am is a complete sentence. And just before the afternoon bell, she made the math equation look easy, the one that proves that hundreds of questions and feeling cold and all those nights spent looking for whatever it was you lost and one person add up to something. I, I call this talk spiritual report cards. And I have been running away from failure ever since I was first aware there was even such a thing as a report card. I couldn't imagine anything worse than getting an F. The humiliation, the disgrace. So I made sure that I never did. I actually lived through my school years believing my GPA and my self-worth were one and the same thing. Even though ultimately a 4.0 grade point average was flimsy proof indeed of any kind of self-worth. But still a string of A's did offer some momentary consolation and camouflage, if you will, for my true failure as a boy, as a straight boy doing straight boy things, not like the other boys at all. It leaves me to wonder how many of us still live our lives as if there will be a report card at the end, as if we'll be judged ultimately on the meaning of our lives, the meaning of our work, how many things we acquired, how much money we made, what kind of a parent were we? Or conversely, living with the bone-chilling fear that I must have been absent that day, unaware that this particular moral challenge would be on the final exam, and I blew it. Sharon is facing the imminent end of her life, ovarian cancer, and she wrestles with that very fear. Michael, I think I'm a good person and I've lived a decent life, but I've made my mistakes, big ones, and I have my regrets. What if I don't get into heaven? As if she will be judged on her resume and not on, say, the love that's in her heart or what she learned along the way, if she's even to be judged at all. My grandmother, Barbara, my dad's mom, was one tough cookie. So tough, in fact, that her standard reply to the greeting, how are you, was, I'm just as mean as usual. <laughs> I don't believe in failure, she would say. There's no such thing, because you can always learn something. It's a pretty commonly held perception, particularly among those given to positive thinking as a way of navigating through life. And certainly within the mythos of American notions of success. But what I found lacking in my grandmother's declaration was compassion. If I were broken hearted that I didn't get the thing I wanted more than anything else, devastated really after working so hard to get it, I really didn't want to hear, well, I'm not going to feel sorry for you because you're going to learn something through this. That wasn't helpful at all in the moment, even if it proved to be true in time. Compassion, after all, only means to be with suffering, to be with it, not to fix it, not to correct it, not to advise it or compare it. I would say that authentic compassion for ourselves and each other might be the one true great healer. And yet it's not an attribute I've ever seen on any report card or any measuring stick for success. At the same time, I resonate deeply with the writings of Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl, in the end, everything can be taken from a man but this one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. 
So there it is. Maybe it is ultimately up to me to write my final grade, to cast that final verdict. But I find myself wrestling with this all too human need to cast any verdict at all, to see life through this dualistic lens of success and failure, win or lose. What if it's not so simple as that, so clear cut as that? In the early 90s, I had a design business and a big economic recession hit Los Angeles at the time and my business fell off to zero. I needed to do something quick. As a stopgap survival strategy, I took the CBEST test, I got an emergency teaching credential and I was hired as a substitute school teacher for Inglewood Unified School District. This was a few weeks after the Rodney King uprising in Los Angeles. It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> But soon enough, I discovered I did not have the constitution to face those schools every day. So on my off days, I volunteered at Project Angel Food, delivering home-cooked meals to homebound people with AIDS. These were the peak years of the AIDS crisis. And I also got involved with a fledgling volunteer AIDS hospice group called Project Nightlight. But at the time, I felt like the loser of the world, an abject failure firmly attached to that idea. I assiduously avoided friends who might call me, dare to ask the unthinkable question, so what are you doing these days? What's more, I felt like a spiritual failure, as if God had somehow dispensed all the components necessary to live a successful life to everyone else except me. Firmly attached to that idea. And yet when I look back on that point in time now, I see it as the pivot point that made this part of my life possible, that directed me toward this career of chaplaincy, though it took so many years to get here, but a career that fills my heart, gives my life meaning, makes the whole mess so far seem to make sense. So am I to look back on that time and call it a success, even a blessing hurting so badly that I wanted to die? The older I get, I find the less patience I have with that dualistic either-or kind of thinking. In the world of cancer, the stakes are much higher when it comes to our perceptions of success and failure. If this disease ultimately means the end of my physical body, does that mean that Western medicine failed, my doctor failed, this drug trial failed, my vegan diet failed, my acupuncturist failed, my prayers failed, my affirmations failed, God failed, me, I failed God. These profound experiences of failure are not just the province of patience. Over the years, I've walked beside countless folks left behind, the bereaved, and they too, almost universally, wrestle with profound experiences of failure. If I hadn't spent so much time at work, I could have taken better care of her. She might still be here, Michael. If it weren't for my depression and my anxiety, I know I caused her so much distress. That's why the cancer came back. It's my fault. If I had just insisted that he go to the doctor sooner, that we get a second opinion. The thing about needing to cast a verdict one way or another, I find is that very seldom is there room for the verdict to be not guilty. Deanna is living with an aggressive colon cancer. She's also deeply rooted in a faith system that might best be described as new age, believing she can manifest her reality as she imagines it and desires it through positive thinking and prayer and affirmation and faith. And up until now, that system has worked rather well for her. She's found herself a wonderful mate, enjoys continued success in her business. She's someone who is a goal setter and a planner. She likes goals with nice, tidy, measurable outcomes. So each win only solidifies her faith that much more. How could it be otherwise? But now the tables have turned and her disease is progressing. That whole paradigm of goal setting becomes far more challenging, maybe even a little murky. If cure is medically off the table, what's the most she can hope for? More time living with cancer. What's more, she feels like a spiritual failure. I guess my faith wasn't strong enough. I guess my prayers weren't good enough. My affirmations weren't strong enough. It's my fault. Over 20 years ago, I was covering an overnight on-call shift at UCLA Medical Center. It was late, 
on a Sunday night and I was paged to come up to the ICU. There was an, a woman there, an elderly African-American matriarch of a large family. She was very near death. The family wanted some support and maybe a prayer. I offered them that and I left. A couple hours later, I was paged to return to the unit because the woman had passed away. And the family now just wanted company while they waited for their pastor to arrive. Once he arrived, he took one look at the scene and said, it looks like you all didn't pray hard enough. As if this loving family had failed their mother, as if death itself were a failure. And if that's true, all of us are guaranteed an F on our final report card. Spiritual success, spiritual failure, these are tricky concepts. Again, this either or kind of thinking. Over the years, walking beside countless folks, I've walked beside folks that would say they have a very deep faith and folks that would say they have no faith at all. And yet, with a common longing for strength, I wish I believed more. I wish my faith were stronger. And when we tease apart, what do you mean by that? Strong faith. It usually means certainty. I want to know that I'm going to beat this cancer. I want to know that this drug trial is going to work. I want to know that I have the best doctor. I want to know that the Lord's got my back. If I'm certain, I'm not really walking in faith anymore, am I? To me, faith might better be described as a willingness to step off into the unknown with my doubts and fears in tow and continuing to walk anyway, with my eyes and heart open, with humility, with patience, with compassion, even for my experience of failure. With Deanna, who liked to set nice, tidy goals, we looked at what another goal might be without such a fixed outcome. What about a goal of coming to peace with uncertainty, with powerlessness, with offering herself the grace to be a human being with more questions than answers? In these years that we've all lived through of the pandemic and all of these extreme measures we've had to endure, there are those among us, myself included, who at times have sought to reframe, redefine our notions of spiritual success because the times seem to demand it. And there are those eternally optimistic spiritual folks who have likened this to a golden opportunity, a chance to hit the reset button for life on planet Earth, to refine and distill all of the extraneous down to what's absolutely essential. And they embrace this. Not me. I have grieved deeply. I never realized just how much of a people person I am, how much of an extrovert that for me, real human contact and physical presence is like oxygen. That kind of connection and connectedness might come even close to the meaning of life for me. So much so that for me, sitting in a darkened, sold-out theater, knee-to-knee with strangers, being moved to laughter or tears by the same humanity on display on a stage becomes a religious ritual. Just as it is to gather with my dancing chums on Saturday afternoon in the same dance studio in front of the same mirror, dancing to the same music, and afterward getting to partake in Holy Communion, getting to complain about everything that hurts. Just as it is to wander in some faraway land, down some alleyway among a bunch of locals, many of whom may never have even heard of Los Angeles. Just as it is to hug someone in trouble, a loved one, a friend, a patient, a stranger. So much so that for a long while, let's remember, those experiences were off the table indefinitely, maybe even for the rest of my life, it had seemed. And at the time, I am am embarrassed to say there were times when I wondered whether life was worth living. That I couldn't take it, that I had come face to face with the limitations of my resilience and adaptability, not like those spiritually optimistic folks at all. And so in those moments, I would call myself a spiritual failure and give myself an F. By contrast, Bernadette is 31 years old. She lives with this unbelievable sense of curiosity and humor and acceptance. She seems to live in the place of, gee, I wonder what that would be like. 
So much so that when she began her chemotherapy and her beautiful red hair began to fall out. We had that conversation I often have, most generally with women when they meet that crucible. Some will choose to preemptively shave their heads as a self-empowering gesture and some might choose to make a light-hearted ritual out of it, dye their hair green, invite friends over for a shaving party. No, Bernadette said, I think it'd be really interesting just to see what it would be like to have your hair fall out. And when her treatment was complete and that year had come to a close, she was reflecting on the year that had passed and said, you know, Michael, I guess I'd have to say all in all, it was a pretty good year after all. Bernadette, in a year that includes a cancer diagnosis, chemotherapy, radical double mastectomy, radiation, reconstruction surgery, if that doesn't make for a bad year, what on earth would? I don't know, losing my sense of humor, I guess. A spirit like that cannot be broken. I walked beside Grace over the last six years of her life, ovarian cancer. Grace had lived a life of dizzying twists and turns, both personally and professionally, zigzagging her way across the country. I asked her once, if you had a young person in your life, maybe a grandchild who came to you and said, Grace, what piece of wisdom do you have for somebody like me after having lived such an interesting life? She didn't take much time at all to respond. When the time comes, be ready to go, she said. She actually echoes Joseph Campbell as he describes the hero's journey. In order to be a hero, one must be prepared for when the time comes. That might be the point of all spirituality, he says. Donna and Lois had shared 40-some years together, so at ease with one another, so loving toward one another, creating family in a world that is really utterly hostile to two women calling themselves a family. Over the previous seven years, Lois had been living with ovarian cancer, and as her disease progressed, she chose to take advantage of end-of-life medication for when the going got to be too rough. She was an engaging, vibrant, no-nonsense gal who was way more interested in hearing what you had to say than telling her story one more time. Sometimes it was actually hard to know how much she was suffering because she carried her pain with such grace. Though thoroughly contemporary, knew her way around her computer, though she's in her 80s, she was also deeply rooted in old school values like letter writing and sending thank you notes. One Saturday night, she leaned over and told Donna, honey, I think the time has come and I'm gonna take the medication tomorrow morning. Well, sweetheart, if it hurts that bad, why not take it tonight? I can't. I've got too many things to do. <laughs> what do you have to do that's so important? I have some bills to pay and some thank you notes to send and a couple birthday cards to write. I'll help you do that, said Donna. So on the last night of her life, after 80 years on planet Earth, she spent it most intentionally around the dining table, engaged in the most mundane activities, but activities that are nevertheless rooted in kindness, consideration, connectedness. That is an image of spiritual success in my book. The next morning, she got up and put on her best red silk pajamas and said, I guess I might as well go out in style. If there were such a thing as a spiritual report card, I would give them both an A+. Plus. As I would to Bernadette for her unbelievable adaptability and curiosity and humor, as I would to Grace for her amazing way she rode the wave of life. <clears throat> Spiritual strength, strong faith, you bet, without a shred of certainty in sight. If there is such a thing as a spiritual report card, I would venture to say it's rooted in our capacity for compassion for ourselves and each other, for our lives as they are and as they are not, to come to peace with our own ultimate powerlessness over it, and paradoxically maybe discovering a new kind of power, a deeper power in that. I'm a big documentary film fan, and I remember in 1995 a wonderful Oscar-nominated documentary called Troublesome Creek. It's a story of a family farm in Iowa that had been in the family for generations, over 125 years, 
Russell and Mary continue to work the farm, though they are much older now, having raised their kids who have all moved on and moved away. But the farm is facing foreclosure because of a farming crisis. So it's all hands on deck. All the kids come back to Iowa to do what they can to save the family farm. We're given to believe it will kill mom and dad if they lose the farm and have to move into town. So you're kind of dying a little bit as you watch them auction off the livestock and the farm equipment and their furniture. You see Mary caressing her Ethan Allen dining table. Oh, the Thanksgiving dinners I served at this table. Sold. They can't lose the farm, but they do. And to everyone's amazement, they thrive. Russell is a new man. He's unencumbered by all of that backbreaking labor and nonstop worry. One of these guys that has those wild, untamed, bushy eyebrows that go every way, you wonder, what's up with the eyebrows, Russell? And there he is in the barber chair, getting them all trimmed up, looking his best. I'll never forget the last line of the film. It's narrated by their daughter, Jean. Success and failure. Sometimes it's hard to tell which is which. Yes, it is. So be it. Thank you.